Well, I'm going to go ahead and get, get started. Good evening, everyone. I'm Cheryl Hoka McCoy, Dean of the School of Education at American University, and welcome to our Big Ideas in Education series. This series was initiated um, as, a, as a way to engage our community on issues and topics related to the current state of education, particularly in terms of addressing racial and economic inequities in education. And as we prepare as a nation for in-person schooling again and life after the pandemic, we all know that there are huge education questions and topics of interest stemming from how to address potential loss of learning to how to address longstanding inequities stemming from racist policies and practices and schools. And if you haven't already, please check out our, our past Big Ideas sessions with former Secretary of Education, John King, and our last session with Dr. Cynthia Miller Idris, in which she discussed the rise of hate groups among youth in the US and abroad. All of these, all of our next Big Ideas and Education series topics have really linked to life after the pandemic and these really huge questions that we need innovative uh, responses to. Next week, I encourage all of you to check us out again for a lively discussion on anti-racist K-12 education with Dr. Aurelius Diaz from the Kellogg Foundation, Dr. Andre Perry from Brookings the Brookings Institute, and also Dr. Bren Elliott from the District of Columbia Public Schools. It should be, don't miss it. It's gonna be a wonderful conversation about how to operationalize anti-racist practice in K-12 education. Today, I'm elated to welcome another speaker who I'm sure will help us further clarify the concept of anti-racist education and teaching. Dr. Carrie Ann Eskai who is assistant professor at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. I first met Dr. Eskai at the first ever conference last summer, I think it was last August, which was convened by the Educators for Anti-Racism group. And her session as a former kindergarten teacher myself, her session was such a hit and she just wowed all of us by her discussion of anti-racist practice and early childhood education. I think you will find her so engaging today through her stories and her narratives about how she came to this place of looking at bias and anti-racism in the classroom. There's a lot to learn today. So I'm so happy she's with us and happy that you all are gonna be engaged with her today. Just a little bit more about this, Dr. Eskai, I wanna share with you, not only does her research focus on anti-racism in early childhood education, but she also has studied children and race in general. As a social theorist, Dr. Eskai has utilized elements of critical race theory, black feminist thought and anti-racist education to offer new ways of thinking about children's racial identity development, including strategies to promote positive racial identity among black children. Central to Dr. Eskai's work is a commitment to racial equity in early years and the holistic well-being of children of color and Black children in particular. I just think it's really interesting that in addition to all of her scholarly and activist pursuits, she also writes short stories, poetry, and children's literature, and maybe we'll find out even more about that later on today. I even ordered a copy of her co-authored book entitled Don't Look Away, Embracing Anti-Bias in the Classrooms, and I can't wait uh, to read it. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Eskai in a few minutes for a short presentation that she's prepared for us. And then we will have just a conversation, me and her, um, with some questions I have for her um, that she is willing to answer and be in a conversation with me about. And then I'm going to turn it over at five o'clock to Dr. Carolyn Parker, who is the director of our Masters of Arts and Arts and Teaching program, our MAT program. And then she will facilitate a conversation um, guided by the questions from our audience. So just thrilled to have Dr. Parker with us to join with us today in this conversation, as well as Dr. Eskai. So before I, I hand it over to our guests, I, uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, notes. As you probably have figured this out, there's no chat feature tonight, um, no video or audio feature 
at all. So there's no way that you can turn on your camera. The questions have been gathered, um, were gathered at the time of registration. So no live question and answers tonight. Um, but please, please engage with us if there are any questions that you have about our programs or any questions for Dr. Askai, um, let us know and then maybe we can find out the answers um, for those questions that you might have. This event will be recorded and available on our YouTube page. So please tell your friends um, and colleagues um, if they would like to see the event tonight that they can engage on YouTube with us. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Eskai, who will share her screen and, um, and we'll see her presentation. Thanks again for coming. And thank you for having me. Welcome, everyone. My presentation will focus on anti-racism in early childhood education. Given that this term may be new to some, I wanna start by defining what exactly is anti-racist early childhood education. Well, first, anti-racist ECE recognize the effects of systemic racism, the economic effects, the psychological effects, the educational inequities, not only in the classroom, but in the broader US society. Anti-racist early childhood education work towards systemic change in ECE. That is the policies, teacher education, as well as classrooms. In anti-racist early childhood education, we do not confine our activism to classroom spaces, but rather policies. Whereas the emphasis is generally placed on teaching, for example, in anti-bias education, and later on I'm going to unpack this some more, anti-racist ECE calls attention to and seeks to dismantle the interrelated nature of racism, systemic racism, including how it manifests in various ECE-related contexts and institutions. In other words, Anti-racist early childhood education works with the idea that in order to effectively advance change, you must critique and dismantle all of the systems. It's not sufficient to address the issue in one context and leave the others untouched. That's not anti-racist work. Furthermore, anti-racism early childhood education accords centrality to race while at the same time acknowledging the intersectionality of other social identities. You see, there's a noticeable danger in lumping race with other social identities. And anti-racist ECE addresses such limitation. I want to clarify here what I mean by that in terms of the centrality of race. Far often when Issues of oppression are brought to the table for discussions for systemic change. Other forms of oppression are recognized, whereas racism and even the word race are often marginalized. So when we say we're giving the centrality to race, it is because of this, this continuing attempt to erase race and racism from social justice conversations. Therefore, I pose the question, why is it at times there is this reluctance to name racism? Call it for what it is. In a similar vein, anti-racism in early childhood education engages in a comprehensive critique of early childhood which allows us to distinguish the supporting mechanisms of systemic racism and how these contribute to, for example, Eurocentric teacher education, silence histories and perspectives, racism in schools, earliest settings, the wage disparities in childcare and school as context for racial trauma. 
I'm going to spend some time with the Eurocentric teacher education. We need to pay attention to teacher education because if teacher education continues to reproduce these Eurocentric perspectives in curriculum, in pedagogy, then teacher candidates will not have the skills, the anti-racist skills and dispositions that are necessary for anti-racist teaching. The silence histories and perspectives refer to the resistance of Black educators that are not typically included in curriculum in ECE. What I mean by school as a context for racial trauma, especially when it comes to young children, I'm referring to the ways in which educators may misinterpret, let's say a white child's racial attitude, instead of addressing that racial attitude and in creating an anti-racist learning environment, which is psychologically safe for black children I don't know if you recall, there was an instance, an incident wherein a four year old child is crying that her peer, because her peer told her that you can play with her because she is Black. Now, the question becomes how is it in such an environment, one, the teacher missed this incident because the mother had to call the, the child care center to inform them of this incident? And two, why did it happen in the first place? Why was this space, or what I call a race silence space, such that young children, young white children are not given the opportunity to dismantle their beginning understandings of white privilege and power because that's what the child enacted, white privilege and power. So when I talk about this comprehensive critique of ECE and dismantling systems, I'm re also referring to recognizing that Black children and children of color experience racial trauma in schools, and there needs to be policies to address those experiences. Furthermore, white privilege and power structure and inform ECE. If you take a critical look at the history of ECE, the Eurocentric underpinnings become very clear. Therefore, it is important that we question the types of knowledge that are included or excluded in teacher education, as well as access to ECE, quality ECE, as well as who gets discipline, with what frequency and how by foregrounding the pervasiveness of anti-Black racism in education, because there's a distinction, anti-Black anti -black racism generally refers to the dehumanization of the Black body. The Black body is not seen as human. Anti-racist early childhood education I therefore highlights the realities and experiences of Black children Black ECEs, early childhood educators, teachers, and families with an aim towards promoting change. It's not enough to bring these experiences, these realities to national attention, let's just say, but also to utilize these as a mechanism to advance systemic change. I'll talk about myself to give an example. As a black feminist, I believe in and practice other mothering. I see black children in the classroom as my black child, my black son, my black daughter. So therefore, when I as a teacher educator enter my classroom to teach any course, whether it may be intro to early childhood education, family-centered partnership. My primary aim is to ensure that the students that I teach 
receive a learning experience so profound that it enables them to critique, to interrogate, to question how they may be actively contributing to racism. But not only that, how can they themselves be anti-racist educators? I bring in the voices of Black children. I bring in the voices of Black families. I decenter whiteness in my classroom. In short, anti-racism in ECE points out racialized power. And not only cultural power, I'm talking about economic power. And the ways in which such is operationalized in the field of ECE. In sum, anti-racism in early childhood education seeks structural transformation through a national anti-racist early childhood education policy. This is not to suggest that there are not policies that seeks to redress inequities but my focus is on developing an anti-racist early childhood policy that will benefit teachers who are doing anti-racist work, children, of course, Black children, Black families, and also ensure that these systemic inequities that affect the lives of Black children and Black families no longer exist. Such is the goal, such is the vision of anti-racism in early childhood education. I hope you join me in this collective effort, an effort which is necessary, an effort which is urgent, an effort that cannot be ignored. Thank you so much for those powerful words. And I'm, I'm, I was jotting down all kinds of questions, so I have lots to ask you based on your, um, on your presentation, but thank you. Once, there's a lot of wonderful gems of knowledge that you just um, shared with us. I have a couple of questions. My first one though, you know, and this is related to what you were just talking about as far as race. One thing that really struck me in early childhood education, ECE, we're talking about young children, pre-K, very mm -hmm. young. I'm just wondering, when do you, when, what does the research say about when children first recognize race or mm -hmm. racial differences? When would you say, what is, what age? Yes, well, the research shows, and there is ample research conducted on this, on this particular area, between two to three years of age, and this is Goodman's model um, of racial identity development, between two to three children start recognizing racial differences. So differences in skin color and hair, hair texture. But the critical period in which they start expressing racial attitudes or prejudice is between the ages of four and five. Developmental psychologists indicate, however, true racial attitudes occur around eight years of age. That's when they understand race in more complex ways. Wow, so that's why this is so critical, the work yes. that teachers do in yes. that age group around the messages that we send about, mm -hmm. you know, which races are superior or inferior or what matters. That is um, just um, astonishing that it happens so young. Um, so so young. And so that is a really, so this makes it even more urgent and critical. And as you were talking about anti-racism, one thing that we're, we are, have embarked upon in our school of education is um, this journey of becoming an anti-racist learning community. Mm -hmm. And in this journey, we have um, our diversity and inclusion and equity committee has been you know, really having some rich discussions about how to define anti-racism. One of the questions that always comes up, and you probably can imagine, yes. is what is the difference between culturally responsive teaching yeah. and anti-racist teaching, if there's such a thing as anti-racist teaching? How do you see yeah. the two, how do you define anti-racism? You, you told us a little bit about it, but how do you then determine the difference between culturally responsive teaching and anti-racist practice in teaching? 
Well, first, there are definitely similarities between the two, but anti-racist teaching is a component of anti-racist education. So that's the first idea I want to just touch upon right there. Um, so, and I mentioned this before, but anti-racist education recognized that racism in schools is just a reflection of what's happening in society. And with that said, anti-racism education or anti-racist education seeks to dismantle racism in schools wherever it may be manifesting. Teacher-student interactions, policies, curriculum. It looks at the school as this broader institutional context in which many of the inequities in society are manifesting in classrooms as well. So, mm -hmm. right, but the, the, the method of anti-racism is very action-oriented and very activist in the sense that we want to dismantle those inequities. We want to make sure that Black children and children of color are given the opportunity to succeed and mm -hmm. also to feel like they belong in the, in the classroom and in the schools. Um, another distinction with anti-racist teaching is that it advocates for anti-racist policies in schools. Mm -hmm. So the policies in schools that would redress these inequities. So for example, in terms of discipline, what policies can we implement to ensure that black children and children of color do not receive harsher discipline than their white counterparts? Um, and anti-racist teaching is not only about the learning materials, but it's also about an anti-racist pedagogy because you can have the materials but it is what you do with the materials that make a difference. How do you teach? What, what, what are your strategies for engaging a student? Those are some of the, 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 the features of anti-racist teaching and creating an anti-racist classroom environment. Yeah. Culturally responsive teaching, very similar to anti-racist teaching, centers students' culture into the curriculum and in doing so, it provides learning experiences consistent with students' cultural identities. However, in addition to honoring students' racial and cultural identities, anti-racist teaching provides students with an opportunity to acquire critical consciousness surrounding issues of race and racism. Anti-racist educators ask themselves, how can I teach this lesson? in such a way as to facilitate both racial pride and activism. So I, I want to make sure that my students feel proud about their identities, but they're also equipped with agency or even recognize that they have agency to make a change, right? Mm -hmm. I ensure that my teaching practices, my pedagogy, my teacher-student interactions do not signify deficit-based perspective. You see, for some, um, it is easy to talk about culture. For some, mm -hmm. it's non-confrontational. I would say, in my opinion, what gets people a bit more anxious, however, is when you center race and racism. Hence the reason why I talked about according the saliency to race, right? When you identify the issue, when you diagnose the issue for what it is, and it is racism, so even the term anti-racism can be jarring to some, which however, if you examine that reaction more closely, you would realize that it is the enactment of silencing through racial privilege. So these are some of the, the, the distinctions between culturally responsive and anti-racist teaching. So in many ways, so you can be culturally responsive and not address Yes, exactly. some of the racist ideas that one could have because it's centered on the culture, not the system exactly. of racial of racist policies and those kinds of things. So exactly. there is a distinct difference. I mean, both need to be addressed, but there is exactly. a distinction between the two. Yes. And that's really interesting. This whole process of naming, you know, you talked about why don't we, you know, that even when we mention race or racism, there exactly. is a certain, you know, tense. People get yeah. very tense and yes. anxious about those conversations. And so yeah. this notion of being silent um, is, a, is a very powerful one, because if we're being silent, that can be mistaken for 
um, yeah. agreeing with these racist ideas exactly. and policies, yeah, which is exactly. so important. It's, you know, it's the intersection yeah. between language and power, who has the power to, to, to name and to yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so as you were talking, you know, and I'm sure the audience out there probably has already figured out that, you know, you um, you sound like you're from, not from yeah. the United States, right? Yes. <laughs> and, yes. Um, or you could, you sound like you're from the United States, but there could be um, yes. uh, another um, place yeah. and you grew up in Trinidad, which is wonderful. Yes. Yes. And, and, you know, because some of our work as teachers and educators comes from our own upbringing. You know, I've always said that, you know, I teach yes. with the, um, through the prism or my lens of yes. how I was raised or my yes. lived experiences. We can't help that, but we have to control for that because some of our lived experiences can um, create some bias in the classroom as well. But yes. can you tell us how your upbringing, your growing up in Trinidad really has in, inspired and informed your work? Yes, and now we're going to delve into storytelling time. Yeah, there you go, there you go. <laughs> With a little bit of history for good measure, okay. There you go. All right, so I often tell my students uh, positionality is such a central role in how we see ourselves, others, and society. I am no exception. Um, growing up in Trinidad in the Caribbean, I would say afforded me the opportunity to recognize the convergences and the divergences between my experience my experiences, and those of my brothers and sisters of the diaspora, including the US. For instance, drawing on my childhood reflections, childhood narrative, I quickly realized that lighter skin tones were a type of social currency, not only in Trinidad, not only in the Caribbean, but across the globe, and that young children internalize these messages at an early age. And unless these ideas, unless these messages are interrupted, they will continue to have this colonized consciousness. So I often tell my students when I'm teaching, I said, imagine I am a little brown girl in the Caribbean. And why is it that I'm putting a towel on my head pretending to be Shira? Now, mind you, the generation that they don't know who Shira is, <laughs> Google it, okay? She was a she's hero, she had a sword. Maybe that explains my feminism, I don't know. But, right, I said, how is it, right? This, this country's predominantly African Trinidadians, East Indian Trinidadians, Trinidadians of different ancestries. So how is it? Later on, I realized that children in the US, children in Canada, had the same experience as five-year-old Carrie Ann. Now, what explains that? So I would say, um, I tell others I was an anti-racist and an anti-colonial scholar, even before I knew what those terms were. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna take you back here to my high school years. I would speak out on racism. I was gripped with this deep rage when I learned about slavery. But when the teacher talked about the rebellions, I glow with pride. And I'm telling you now, I am firmly convinced if I trace my ancestry, I would find that I'm somehow related to some kind of revolt leader. <laughs> because it was, it, it was as if I carried the memories, the the proclivities to resist, to critique, to call out in my DNA. Wow. I felt that ancestral connection. Mm -hmm. I had and still have this keen sense of justice. When I got older, I would say like around college, I began to see even more the parallels between the colonial legacies evident in Trinidad, social structure, including the economic dis disparities who controls the wealth. Mm -hmm and that of the US. I would certainly attribute such a decolonization process to my love for literature and history. Scholars and novelists of the African diaspora, African-American, Trinidadian, Canadian, they facilitated my decolonization by writing on and sharing their own experiences, their experiences about pain, 
about trauma, about the trauma of racism and colonization. And this approach, along with my earliest experiences, certainly inform my work. You see, I strive to ensure when I think about five-year-old Carrie and putting on that towel in her head, on here, I'm motivated even more. I strive to ensure that Black children know who they are, that their minds are not tainted by the false narrative of Black inferiority, but they are empowered by stories of Black brilliance of agency, that they recognize their worth and they resist racial and colonial legacies. I utilize discussions rooted in history and uncover silence stories. Pan-African unity is not a new concept. Trinidadians such as Henry Sylvester Williams, Kwame Ture, C.R.L. James were revolutionaries in their own right. I'm not the only one who have seen the promise of Pan-African unity for children, for families, for the diaspora. Like those who came before me, however, my path, my passion is justice for the oppressed, for the African diaspora and for reparation because racism and capitalism are linked. And I don't know if you know this, I, I love, this is me just loving history, right? Um, when emancipation was implemented in Trinidad, plantation owners receive, some reports indicate between one to two million pounds. And I know American, that they also receive compensation did the enslaved in the US receive anything? No. Did the enslaved in Trinidad receive anything? Not one cent. History cannot be erased. History cannot and should not be ignored. But amends, amends can certainly be made through reparation. So, you know, so thank you. I mean, that is um, such a powerful story and it's a lot to unpack there. I have so many questions just swirling through my head, but the notion of the African diaspora, you know, and the history that you just shared is never, in my understanding, in most of our education preparation programs, is not necessarily a part of the program. Now, some of our students in our undergraduate program, for instance, will take courses within the College of Arts and Sciences that are part of their requirements. But, you know, this notion of understanding as a part of the anti-racist mm -hmm. curriculum, this notion of including historical, you know, readings um, is so important to understand how did we get here, right? Yes. How did we get to this place? Yes. And that understanding, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing from you, this is important for educators yes. to, to understand yes. that, right? And the, the politics behind education often, because, mm -hmm. you know, when we start talking about reparations now, yes. it becomes politicized. And yes. um, someone said to me just the other day, and I was mentioning this to students yesterday um, at a, a meeting with students, that, you know, this notion that education is political. And I said, yeah, it is. I think it is because it, is. it has been politicized. So if we take a stand on reparations based on history, it yes. is, becomes political. What's your sense? I mean, do you do you feel this, you know, when, you know, this, the politicalization, if that's a word, of education, how does that dovetail some of your work? I mean, yeah. does that interfere in any way? It does not one bit. <laughs> I don't know why I asked that. I, I knew what you were going to say, given that you said that you have always had that streak of, yes, this is what I believe in. But yes, but it's it, like I'm not. it <laughs> does not. It does not. I will say. Educator, right? Most, yes, a lot I will. Of educators are bothered sometimes. They don't want to be political. Yes, right? but 
It is, like you said, it is political. It is political when you have a system that was created to maintain oppression. It is a system where black children and brown children cannot see themselves represented. It is political. These are all political decisions for a specific purpose. So if you refuse, you refuse to see it as political, it doesn't change the fact. It just means you become complicit, which is what we want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the notion of um, your story, which is a part of critical race theory, is to tell our narratives and to tell our yeah. stories. How much yeah. do you use critical race theory and storytelling in your teaching um, yes. of future teachers? And how much do you use it if you were in a classroom with small children? How could oh. you use that? Yes, I'll start with the teacher education because it's been a long time since I've been with the five-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> I have to remember that one. Uh -huh. um, but in teacher education, I love to use stories because that is our cultural tradition. That's how I believe. This is just my opinion. That's how I believe we were strengthened each day when we had to face such harsh, oppressive experiences just to, just to articulate. In fact, you know, story is catharsis in the sense that whatever is the pain, whatever is the wound that is in your soul, when you articulate it, you release it, right? Mm -hmm. So in my teacher education classes, I'm starting, my starting point is that they have been exposed to false narratives. Now you're going to hear counter narratives that speak against these narratives, but not only that, I'm going to contextualize it for you to show you how these narratives, these dominant narratives really are underpinned by privilege and power. So when I bring, bring these counter narratives in my classroom, it's a way for me to say to them, past and present, I honor your stories. And it is a way for me to tell my students, this is a legacy that you need to be aware of. Now with the younger ones, who I love <laughs> to credit my kindergarten class, um, before I started full-time teaching at the university because it was while teaching that I came up with all these stories about John the Little Mango. I had a student that couldn't stay still. His name was John. Okay, we're going to create a story about a mango, right? So I used a lot of storytelling in my classroom. And what I always remember is that that look on the child's face when you implement an approach that they can relate to, that they can say, so, oh, I can make a connection to this. This is something I do at home. This is something my mom does with me. This is something that reminds me of who I am. So when I look back on my former elementary teaching experiences, these experiences inspire me even more to bring in stories and storytelling because the issue here is voice and the connection between voice, agency, and empowerment. Wow, voice, agency, and empowerment. And what better way to do that than through literature, right? Um, to, you know, and the importance of bringing in books that represent diverse lived experiences um, and bringing in books that from authors that have written from, you know, having a diverse, um, group of authors that are represented in one's classroom and particularly books that will, like you said, that will counter these negative racist narratives mm -hmm. that students are hearing. You mentioned colorism too, which, yeah. you know, I, I can't help but to, you know, because that is an, I don't think we can talk about anti-racism, anti-black racism. We, we see colorism in Latinx populations and, and yeah. groups as well. Colorism is, um, is something that we see globally. And we often do not talk about the impact of color. And for mm -hmm. young women, um, it is um, an issue that, that comes up in a lot of the literature and the research. Mm -hmm. how, how have your experiences in talking about anti-racism and colorism, how do you bring that up with small children or with parents even um, of some of your mm -hmm. students? I mean, is that something that you broach? Is that a yes. topic that you broach with parents? Yes. Um, well, I would say with, with my um, teacher candidates, right? Um, more so in the sense that the research shows us that young children 
are assigning these negative meanings to skin tone. So how you disrupt that is having conversations about the beauty and the value of all skin tones. And the other um, advice I give them and what I emphasize in my classroom is that you want to be proactive, not reactive. When a situation occurs in a classroom, yes, you have to deal with it. But the first day that child or your, all your students walk into the classroom, have something on the wall that shows them different skin color, have conversations about different skin color. And, and not only that, but hair texture, that's another thing too, right? So skin color and hair texture, the books that you, that you utilize, the picture books, have them depict children of you know, brown skin color, different darker skin tones, so that children recognize that there is value to this skin tone. These, these pejorative meanings are, are not applicable to me. They're not, they are false in, in, in essence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With, um, you know, your experiences outside of the United States, um, mm -hmm. anti-racism uh, globally, you've been talking yes. about that. Do you feel as though there is a different view of anti-racism you know, within the United States compared to in other countries? I mean, are other, you know, researchers across the globe talking about anti-racism in the same way or decolonization? Um, mm -hmm. What have been your experiences with that? Um, in countries that have strong, and I emphasize that, uh, historical and current ties to Europe, former colonial powers, such that whites retain economic power, I would say anti anti-racism is viewed the same and even conceptualized the same because if we look back to the earlier writings on anti-racism, um, they were from scholars in Britain and in Canada. And those ideas are basically the same as US-based scholars who write about and research anti-racism. However, in the Caribbean, and I'll speak for Trinidad only, there are context specific histories and nuances, nuances that must be taken into account um, and this is like the topic for a separate web webinar, so <laughs> it's too much detail. Well, I'm, I'm asking you, yeah. we have, we have uh, an entire yes. program, international training yes. and education program, where those students are interested in the global perspective, international yes. perspective. And so oh, right. it really is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it is, it's another webinar, you yeah. could ask. But it yes. is so important to our discussion, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a brief snippet so that <laughs> those students who are interested can watch this web and I go, oh, this is interesting. Let me do some research for myself. All right. So let's go. For instance, in Trinidad, in comparison to the US, the slavery period was relatively shorter, um, about 50 years. And that was because uh, Trinidad was an underdeveloped Spanish colony. It was only when the study of population was implemented in 1783 that the enslaved population increased. Uh, Spain ceded Trinidad to Britain in 1802, which also resulted in more of the enslaved population coming to Trinidad. Um, but slavery was abolished in 1834. There was a four-year apprenticeship period that initially was supposed to last for six years, but my fellow ancestors made me proud, revolted and resisted. So ended in 1848. When you compare such history with that of the US, let's say reconstruction era, Jim Crow, there are noticeable differences. So it means that the continued subjugation of African-Americans through violent means occurred for a longer period of time. However, racial ideologies that supported slavery, here's where the similarity um, is evident, were also prevalent in Trinidad. For instance, uh, a European wrote, um, who wrote the guidebook and history of Trinidad in 1897, went so far to say that the tendency of Trinidad Blacks was towards barbarism. In other words, they were savages. Doesn't that bear striking parallels to the racist ideas in the US during the time period of slavery. Same, same racist ideas. Um, furthermore, similar to the US, there was widespread racial discrimination in schools, churches, and employment. 
I bring up all of these historical facts to not only highlight the similarities derived from the shared experience of slavery and colonization, but also to illustrate how fundamental anti-Blackness was and remains to racial oppression and the legacies of slavery and colonization. Wow. So, some similarities there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the similarities are there. I mean, the history mm -hmm. is for itself, right? Yes. And that knowledge, again, is not necessarily part of the training of becoming a teacher, right? To understand exactly. when you have children in your class from other parts of the world and the similarities around issues around racism or there's some there are linkages and as you said um there are some of that same yes. history and ideas um yes. about um race and who's a part of which race and that's that's all a part of that that's so um so you know i'm going to switch gears right now because that's a good segue yes. into what actually has to happen in a classroom, the anti-bias work that you've done or the curriculum mm -hmm. that you have been uh, writing about, yes. um, an anti-bias uh, curriculum for the classroom. Um, what, what is that all about? What are the major underpinnings? So uh, what is it that you believe that should be in place for an anti-bias curriculum, classroom curriculum? Right. So anti-bias education, as it has been conceptualized, is predicated on central ideas. Such include developing students' sense of identity, comfort with diversity, diversity, sense of fairness, and skills for empowerment. One strength of the anti-bias education, I must admit, is that it recognizes that children acquire their racial awareness at a very young age and that teaching practices must attend to these in ways that are empowering for children of color, for black children. Um, these goals for anti-bias also are not meant to be understood as isolating con uh, concepts, but rather as guiding principles that build on each other. However, with that said, one of my earlier critiques of anti-bias is that by focusing on all social identities, race tends to be minimized. Additionally, another area I found which was problematic was that the bulk of the earlier research conducted with children focused on racial awareness, identities and attitudes. So my question after I did the research you know, was why was not race given primacy? Why was the term bias used when you had, when black psychologists were conducting research come in an attempt to address these issues, somehow we put other identities in there. We include race, but race is not afforded the prim primacy and it deserves primacy. primacy. And um, in my opinion, when we focus on bias, it tends to deny or downplay racism. White children from an early age demonstrate an acute understanding of white privilege and power. Now, lest I be misunderstood, I am not demonizing white children. What I'm saying is that because of the racial messages to which they are exposed, white children from a very young age are picking up on the privileges they have. And the research shows that their awareness of this privilege is enacted in such a way that it caused psychological harm, in other words, racial trauma, to Black children. An excellent resource that I encourage all educators to read if you are somewhat reluctant to acknowledge children's ability to be racist. Uh, the first R, how young children learn race and racism. I encourage you to read that. It's an excellent resource. So this is why. I, as well as other scholars, very few I may add, started using the term anti-racism in early childhood. Dr. Terry Husband was one of those scholars early on started saying anti-racist early childhood. We saw the gaps and we responded accordingly. So as I mentioned, anti-racism in early childhood is used and has been used by black scholars. Which 
back to what I mentioned earlier about positionality. In other words, the knowledge derived from lived experience, and especially the lived experience of people of color, often allows us to see things that others have not seen, to see things that others have missed, to recognize the omissions and to critique these omissions from a critical anti-racist lens. Uh, so the, so I'm, I'm so glad that you have, you know, the critique of, you know, if we are using the terminology bias and what we're yeah. missing in there. And also the, how powerful again, that children early in the early years are able to exhibit not only bias, but possibly racist <clears throat> yeah. ideas or behaviors, which is yes. so important. So you know what my next question is. <laughs> so if I'm a teacher, yes. and I know this is ha this can happen in my classroom, how do I disrupt that? Mm -hmm. um, and in a way that will promote growth and will you know still keep a child's um, self-confidence in place, how do you disrupt that? I mean, is it through the use of literature? Is it through yeah. the activities you do in a classroom? How do you disrupt this development of this notion that I am privileged or so that you're not, so that, you know, that children are not harmful to others? Exactly. How do you that? In a classroom where the majority of children are white, I often say to the educators, you have double the responsibility. You cannot afford to ignore anti-racism or to not practice anti-racist teaching. If you do so, what you are contributing to is white children continue development of their understanding of white privilege and white power, and also this false belief of white superiority. So with that said, Anti-racist teaching in the early years in a predominantly white space first requires that the white educator knows him or herself. It requires deep self-reflection. And also, it also requires them to examine what they know about racism. Something I do with my teacher candidates is to define racism because we know that the, the conflating of racism with prejudice happens too often. And when that happens, it, it silences or makes invisible these mechanisms such as white privilege and power. So what do you know about race and racism? Okay, so you've gone through that process of self-reflection, reading and all of that. Now, how you structure your classroom also alerts your students to the fact of, hey, this is a, this is a classroom that celebrates I wouldn't say celebrates, but this is a classroom that acknowledges that racism exists. And this is a classroom where we talk about anti-racism. You can do it through literature, picture books, of course. But for some educators, the idea of having picture books is sufficient. It is not. You have to have discussions with children. Think of picture books as your entry point. That's your resource. Mm -hmm. What? to do after to deepen children's understanding. So my colleagues and I are working on um, creating an anti-racism curriculum guide, which will include, include like teacher scripts to guide teachers in, this, in discussions about what is racism, what is privilege, what is power, because these are conversations that are necessary for white children. Because if not, they show up in my classroom with that blank stare and sometimes use the emotions and tears to avert the conversations. And that, that does not faze me. You can cry all you want, Sally. We're still going to have this conversation. You can leave the classroom, sure, but we're still going to have this, con this conversation, right? My priority is not your comfort. My priority is change change for children of color. And, and, and that's the parallel process that happens yeah. in teacher preparation too. Yeah. Right? I mean, those are some of the same dynamics that a faculty member might see um, in 
um, an early childhood education program, right? Because yes. it's really reteaching children that I mean students that might not have had these experiences as kindergartners, whatever. So, yes. you know, when, as we train teachers, it's some of those same dynamics. Yes. Yeah, that's, um, yes. well, when you get that curriculum, yes. you let us know, because I know I Carol will. Parker that's coming on with you in a few minutes is going to say, yes. mail it to me right away. Because yes. it can be used, I think, within, you know, at, in, in our teacher preparation programs. I mean, that is what I think is so needed. We talk about anti-racism. And quite frankly, I, you know, I'm so fearful that this just becomes a term and it doesn't mean anything, right? We, we will use it um, to denote um, that we're not, not racist, but being anti-racist yes. is something so different. And yes. that need to operationalize it so that yes. we know it when we see it, when we walk into a classroom, that yes. we, we can tell this is an anti-racist learning community um, yes. because I'm seeing this, the teacher is doing this. It's so, it's so important. Mm -hmm. Now I could talk mm -hmm. to you for another hour, but we, yes. have, um, we have someone else coming on board. But you know, we, um, in the spirit of uh, one question, one more question, because I think that folks out there might be asking themselves primarily, um, you know, what can I give to, you know, what should I do next um, to further my understanding of anti-racism and ECE? What would, you know, you gave us some books to read, but what do you think is really, really critical for our teacher prep, you know, our teacher candidates, our, yes. um, our future policy makers that are out there mm -hmm. that we have doctoral students, I'm sure that are on prospective students. What would be some of, what would you tell them? be the next step for all of them, a necessary step for that. Yes, so I teach in a predominantly white university and the majority of my students are white females. So whatever I'm giving to teacher candidates is what I have done in the classroom, okay? I inform my students. I teach all of my classes using an anti-racist lens. So I have a disclaimer on the first day. Don't tell me you were shocked and surprised because on the first day, I lay it out for you. Don't <laughs> What we're going, I didn't know we were going to talk about this. How did you not know, right? So I do believe that said, given opportunities and not just one course can help white students in developing anti-racist teaching practices. However, the entire teacher education program and not one professor must be anti-racist. So if we're looking at preparing teacher candidates, it needs to be a structural transformation of teacher education from admission policies to retaining and recruiting faculty of color to examining your curriculum. I have no issue with that. All I'm saying is, why do we not critique the centrality of that? Does it silence diverse knowledges and ways of knowing and being? Um, also, I would encourage, this is the same thing I do with my students, to engage in this critical self-reflection of what you know about racism. In each of my classes, I connect the issue to the historical record. You can't understand present oppression without understanding the roots. In order to know the fruit, you have to go to the root, right? So I, I ground everything in historical analyses. Being an anti-racist educator, I'll tell teacher candidates, is combining a knowledge of racism with a commitment to ending racism. So let's just say you're in the, you're teaching and you're in the school and you have a colleague that says something or acts in a way, are you going to be silent or are you going to address what that colleague, colleague did or said? Okay, so it's, it's about taking those opportunities that are presented to you to further anti-racist change. I say that because if you lack the skills to diagnose the issue, how can you contribute to the solution? And I'll give an a, a example to illustrate. I was once giving a presentation at a convention for privacy purposes, I wouldn't say where I was presenting, okay? But I was presenting and I gave a case study, a narrative on an issue where children, white children were excluding children of color. Now the audience were predominantly white and their first response was, 
well, what would, what did the children do? Was you know, it, it had to be something that the children do in order for the white children to exclude? And I, I was dumbfounded. Why was that your initial response? So it comes back to my earlier point that if you don't have skills to diagnose the issue, how can you create an anti-racist classroom? We know that the research shows that children, young children, let's say three to five, express their racial attitudes in play and in peer interactions. And if you're not observant, if you are of the belief that children don't see race, then you are missing these opportunities for anti-racist practice. Absolutely. Also, for teacher educators, if you do not know how you contribute to the issue, then how can you position yourself as an agent of change? Simply stated, pursue knowledge, pursue self-growth, pursue awareness. Therein lies the pillars of anti-racist teaching in ECE. There you go. Wow. That's that. There you go. Sounds so simple, but yet so it's a life's journey, right? Yes, it definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sky. I'm just so... I feel honored and privileged to have had this opportunity to have this conversation with you. Continue to do the incredible work and um, that you're doing. And don't forget to send us that curriculum. Oh, um, yes. We want to use it. I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Parker, who is going to ask questions from um, our audience. And, um, and then we will close up at 530. Okay? Yeah. I'll turn it over, Dr. Parker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holcomb McCoy. Dr. Sky, thank you so much. You've given me so much to think about both as a faculty member and the director of the MAT program and the mother of two children. Um, as, I, as I think about my intersectionality and my roles, the roles that I play, so thoughtful. Um, I see several of our, many of our teacher candidates on the, in the participant list. And I know they're gonna to wanna to know, can you give us some specific resources? Um, you named one book or preview your curriculum a little bit for the teachers on the call about how you could create a classroom that fosters anti-racist and anti-colonial thoughts, beliefs, and actions in your students. Sure. A role play, As, something like that. Sure. Um, it also bears repeating that you cannot implement anti-racist practice without being an anti-racist educator. So please start your self-journey, your self-reflection journey. Ideally, as I mentioned, an anti-racist curriculum would be best because it will contain the resources. And as I mentioned, the teacher scripts that it can help educators discuss race, racism, racial identity with children. However, there are some picture books that have captured my attention and my heart. Um, 13 Ways of Looking at a Black Boy, Little Leaders, and I Am Enough. Now, as I mentioned before, I engage in Black feminist work. So the reason that I chose these books is because it, I'm, one of them in particular really presents these counter narratives of black females, which I think are absolutely necessary for young black girls to see, to know, to experience. And however, I want to mention that picture books are just the starting point. If you are not prepared to have follow up discussions, critical discussions that will help children understand these mechanisms, understand what are stereotypes and so on, then it just becomes a practice of storytelling activity and not as an opportunity for transformative learning, which ideally you want to happen in your classroom. Sure. So you want to have the skills to transition from just storytelling to critical thinking in the mm -hmm. learning process. Great, thank you. I, I, um, interfacing and working with caregivers, family members, um, whatever the adults in a child's life are, is so important for all educators, right? But particularly in the early childhood setting. Can you give us some strategies for working with parents, particularly parents who may be resistant to an anti-racist approach in a classroom? Okay. This is this actually, and 
And I apologize. I thought of this question as we were talking. No, and that's fine. <laughs> so I no. may have put you on the spot a little bit, but I think it's no. important as we talk with our teachers. Yes. Yes, uh, and this is why it comes back to, and I guess I'm going to switch to my, my legal side because I wanted to be sure. on, I guess that's why I love critical race theory this much, um, but it comes back to having that legal support for teachers when they implement anti-racist practice. So if there was something in the school documents, a, a policy, I think all school boards have a policy on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and mm -hmm. so you have the evidence to show how your work fits with dovetails with the policy, then what can the parents say? All, all the teacher has to say is, it's in the policy. I'm following the policy, mm -hmm. right? I'm sorry if that displeases you, but this is the policy and we want to create an environment in which children of color, black children are respected. Great, thank you. Yes. Can you, um, Elaborate a little bit more on how we understand children's racial identity, particularly at the young ages. All right. So there are various theories, mostly developmental psychology theories on children's identity development. However, common among all these theories is that two to three marks the onset of racial awareness. Around four or five children, we call it self-identify. That is, they can use a racial label, say I'm black or I'm white. But like I mentioned earlier, around eight and even nine, you see these more uh, complex attitudes emerging. However, from a psychological standpoint, uh, researchers have argued that racial attitudes before seven really are derive from the lack of sophisticated cognitions. In other words, because let's say white children don't have the cognition to focus on internal characteristics, this may be the reason why they harbor these negative racial attitudes. However, anti-racist scholars, critical race scholars um, like myself and others, we put forward different analyses of racial attitudes and say it's not only a matter of cognition, we have to look at the contextual influences that are shaping children's racial attitude. They are internalizing this racial discourse and acting upon it, not as a matter of cognition, but what they are seeing and what they are experiencing in their social worlds. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. What are some of the, could you elaborate on some child-friendly ways to talk about race and to build racial literacy in an early childhood education classroom? Mm -hmm. So if we have a classroom with, let's say, predominantly Black ch children of color, the entry point for such discussions, in my opinion, let me qualify that by saying, in my opinion, should not be one of oppression or racism. But mm -hmm. let's have conversations that will instill racial pride in, ch in Black children and children of color. Let's expose them to the diversity of their ancestral knowledge and cultural practices and their group's contributions. After that, however, we can talk about, you know, issues of oppression and racism, but once we give them that grounding of being proud in who they are and being proud of who they are, I think that positions them to have those more critical discussions about racism, because I've said this before, I said racial pride. Sure resistance and resistance is power. So if we want them to start on this continuum, this spectrum of power and agency, let's start by building them up first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And building them early. Exactly. Right, right. I was a high school science teacher and I've come to so respect the importance of the early childhood setting for, for just setting children on a positive path, both socio-emotional, racially, yes. academically. It's just so important that so often we don't attend to. Um, how do you ensure that our early childhood programs understand, so the administrators, the people yes. of power, the importance of a culturally responsive and anti-racist curriculum in the early childhood setting? Yeah, this definitely speaks to power imbalances. So while I believe that in order to affect systemic change in early childhood, in the early childhood field, 
we definitely need an anti-racist policy. I also believe that in some instances, smaller, more micro level interventions are needed. So for this question, I would say consider conducting, if possible, let me just say that, if possible, a study on the effects, the positive benefits of culturally responsive curriculum. And if you can't implement the study, do research, find those studies that indicate a positive association between culturally mm -hmm. responsive teaching and children learning experiences. So that when you have the data, when you have that empirical evidence, you can say, here, here's the evidence to demonstrate that this particular form of teaching benefits students and you know, put in a rhetorical question there for good measure as well. Is that not what, as educators, we are committed to, the well-being of children? Well, this body of research says that it contributes to the well-being of children. So what is the problem? And if the deeper issue is just maybe fear or, you know, racist tendencies, then it also provides an opportunity for more work, anti-racism work, and more anti-racist interventions. Sure. Absolutely, thank you. So we had a request from the audience to repeat the book titles. The one that I, I've got one, the first R. Was the first one R. You had, you had mentioned, and then you had mentioned one earlier when we talked about early childhood education resources. Oh, for the, for the, the picture books. For the picture, picture books. books. I, yes, I am enough. I am enough. 13 ways of looking at a black boy and Little Leaders. Little Leaders is about Black, Black women. I love that book. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, so this goes back to my, my leading question a little bit about caregivers in children's, mm -hmm. um, in the children's world, but also with early childhood educators um, who may be reluctant to believe that the mm -hmm. anti-racism work needs to start in the preschool. What could you suggest to a teacher or an educator who, who wants to make change in the early childhood setting and have an anti-racism curriculum, but they're getting resistance? Okay. So one of the greatest, and this research agrees with us, because one of the greatest barriers to anti-racism in preschools is teachers' misconceptions around children's racial competence. This is why in the anti-racism ECE model that I've conceptualized, one of the foundational principles is reconceptualizing children's racial understandings because of this very issue. So in light of this, I would suggest if you do have administrators support to have workshops on children and race, the literature on children and race is so abundant. The research spans decades starting from 1930. So if you were to have a workshop where the presenter delineates all the research on children and race, perhaps it may shift educators' perceptions. Also, if um, in my book, there is um, my co-authored book, we have a chapter on observing children's play to capture racial attitudes. Again, if there is leadership support, I would suggest that educators do a one-month investigation using that observational tool so they can have their own evidence in front of them that yes, children do display these racial attitudes. They're not as innocent as we think or what you think is innocence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, and what do you believe, what has your experience been with strategies that will really help ensure implementation of anti-racist school practices? What do we have to put into place that's, that's absolutely necessary to put in place? Anti-racist leadership is critical to anti-racist school practices. If you don't have the support of the administrator, you, you will encounter difficulties as some of my students have informed me because I teach anti-racism to graduate students, practicing teachers. So we need administrators who will support anti-racist teaching and by extension an anti-racist school environment. If this is not the case already, this is my suggestion, administrators must complete an anti-racist leadership or certificate course 
prior to receiving an admin position. Um, even when there's a uh, hiring, is there a question when we're hiring, when, we, when you're considering applicants, is there a question on that interview sheet that allows this administrator to talk about his or her vision of an anti-racist school? So these are some of the more um, concrete strategies. Sure. So I would suggest ongoing audits of discipline practices and students' mm -hmm. academic achievement, observations of teacher-student interactions with tools specifically designed to capture bias or racism is another me measure that can be utilized to ensure an anti-racist school. Equally, equally important is the legal recourse that I mentioned earlier through policy that would protect anti-racist educators from backlash, punishment, mm -hmm. harassment from as a result of doing this anti-racist teaching. So it involves several strategies, starting with the ad admin anti-racist leadership to hiring, to audits of the school and teachers' discipline practices, and finally, to having a policy that will protect legally and legally protect anti-racist educators. Yeah, which is so important. You'll, yeah. you'll be happy to know that at American University, we have an EDD program mm. in anti-racist, oh, with fantastic. specific to anti-racism. And mm. we have, I think we're in our fourth cohort, but we have some fabulous doctoral students who are committed to anti-racist education and will be the leaders and are the leaders. Presently, they're leaders, um, central office personnel, uh, nonprofits, teachers. Um, so, so it's just so important. So thank you for that. Um, and then finally, how do you hold the school administrators and teachers accountable to their own biases? in a way that will meaningfully impact our children and all of our children? I love this question. <laughs> I saw this question and I said, yes. <laughs> I wanna make this very clear. Teachers and administrators that act upon their racist ideas and beliefs and those that inflict psychological harm on black children and children of color should be penalized. There was a recent situation involving a teacher in a middle school that told a black child who was wearing a shirt that read black king that he was racist. And what if, according to the reports, what if she was to say she was a white queen? She accused this child of being racist because he exhibited pride in his identity. And now mm -hmm. into the reports, she is suspended with pay. To me, that is an insult to the Black mm -hmm. children, the Black parent and the Black community. So I reiterate my earlier point, they should be penalized. We must have legal power, legal policies that clearly indicate the specific penalties for such actions. In a similar vein, we must also question who occupies positions of power, who investigates malpractice, mm -hmm. and ultimately who renders the verdict. Because there's a tendency to absolve whites of racial wrongdoing, and that is not limited to education. It occurs in the, in the courtroom, in the boardroom, and other institutions. In other words, we need a systemic overhaul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, as I said, as I said, as I began, you really helped me think about from a program directors. We've, in some ways, I'll I'll admit our as we've moved in this direction, I feel as though we've dabbled around the edges a little bit, mm -hmm. and it's helped me understand how. We really need to more deeply um, dive into and integrate anti-racist theories, pedagogies, histories. It hadn't occurred to me, I'm a science educator, it hadn't occurred to me to think back to the history and bring that history forward to help our students be aware 
and understand the systemic racism and the and the the generations of systemic racial racism and educational racism in the United States. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Sure. Yeah. I'm trying to unmute myself, so that's a technology problem. Thank you so much, Carolyn, and thank you for all the students and the audience that has had questions. I think we were able to get to most of our questions this evening, and I just want to thank you again, Dr. Eskai. And if there are any last thoughts that you would like to leave us with, I mean, you have just dropped so much knowledge um, with us, but um, any last thoughts that you have for us um, and as a school of education, as um, aspiring teachers out there, aspiring educators, future leaders, um, anything else that you would like to share? First, thank you for having me. And to those who are listening, and to those who will listen, I honor your lived experience. I value your lived experience, especially if you have been marginalized, are marginalized, experienced oppression. To my brothers and sisters of the African diaspora, whether you may be an educator, a scientist, a parent, a researcher, our people have endured much, much injustice, much suffering, much dehumanization, but yet they resisted. They resisted in the streets, they resisted in the classrooms, they resisted in the comfort of their home. When they refused to accept these false narratives and instead equip their children with self-love and self-knowledge, I would suggest that as we continue to work towards transformation and racial justice, we see our common sufferings as a site for unity, as a site to remind us that we are more powerful than when we recognize these similarities, than when we give in to the colonizer tactic of divide and conquer. And if we hold steadfast to our principles, and if we hold steadfast to the legacies that we have inherited from those who went before us to the glory hills of freedom, justice shall surely come. And what a day it shall be. Wow, can't, can't top that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us and those powerful words. We really appreciate that. And we're going to sign off now. And I hope that folks out there will join us again next week as we bring a panel, have a panel discussion um, on the integration of uh, anti-racism in education, K-12 settings uh, with Andre Perry um, from Brookings Institute, uh, one of our uh, friends from the Kellogg Foundation, and also um, one of our colleagues, Brent Elliott from uh, District of Columbia Public Schools. So we look forward to um, next, week, next week seeing folks again. Thank you, Dr. Eskai. Thank you, Dr. Parker. And we'll Thank sign you, Dr. off. Eskai. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.